It is the cause, not their personal authenticity, that becomes salient. The third element is a totalitarianizing ideology. It is an exclusive belief system that is controlled by the powerful and empowering him or her class. It is an ideology often built on a fictional world of secrets and lies. Total ideology requires confusion, especially when confronted by the reality of logic. Oftentimes, it is founded on sheer uncritical faith in a leader, a cause, or even a religion. Oftentimes, too, it thrives on untruths made popular, repeated over and over. Totalitarianizing ideology relies on false news in order to escape critical scrutiny. Totalitarianizing ideology starts with propaganda, then it graduates to indoctrination. It is intolerant of dissent. It stifles creativity. While it may be a solution to a chaotic world, it restructures individuality. It is definitely inhuman. In 1928, Edward Bernays, the intellectual guru that inspired the propaganda machinery of Nazi Germany, created the, co the concept of public relations for a host of companies as well as softened the media for purposes of supporting coups like in Guatemala and other countries. He published a book entitled Propaganda. In chilling and disturbing detail, he opens his book as follows, and I quote because of its savings. The consciousness and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. These are his words. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed. Our minds are molded. Our tastes are formed. Our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast members of human beings must operate in this manner if they are to live together in a smoothly functioning society. Our invisible governors are in many cases unaware of the identity of their fellow members in this inner cabinet. Close quote. Propaganda disguised as public relations, whether for a political party or a commercial product, is now ubiquitous. The totalitarian ideology, in order to take root, must also be founded on fear. This is the fourth characteristic of systems which gravitate towards authoritarianism. The process of brainwashing relies on psychological and coercive manipulation, alternating terror coupled with perceived killing. When we are frightened, we, are, we do not just run away. We run to something or to someone. That person should be one to whom we feel a sense of attachment. Yet when that same person who presents himself or herself as the object of sanctuary also is the source of fear, then he or she that runs to him freezes. He or she is thus, thus caught between approach and avoidance. A totalitarian ideology presents itself as the only solution. It shapes itself as the exclusive dogma of salvation. Scholars call this phenomenon disorganized attachment. Those familiar with domestic violence are also familiar with its consequences. It is called the battered victim syndrome. It is a syndrome that thrives in the inability to gain safety from a debilitating threat, whether real or imagined. There is no other safe haven except the relationship whose trauma is constantly forgotten. It is in these conditions where an ideology founded on falsehood can be introduced and assimilated. It will be an ideology that explains away the real causes of, strategy, of, of the tragedy. Thus, in relations characterized with battered victims, the ideology is either based on the inevitable fault of the victim herself, or the necessity for discipline to be imposed by the dominant. In societies led by an authoritarian leader, the inevitable sacrifices to liberty are necessary in order to achieve prosperity. Liberty is faulted for the chaos. Tolerance for the rights of others, even human rights, is cast as the problem. There is also a phrase which describes this phenomenon 
when it plays throughout our entire society. Gramsci introduced the term and he calls it cultural hegemony. The fifth element in a totalitarian system is the creation of deployable and loyal followers, terrorists who blow themselves up for the concept of fictional liberty, followers willingly putting their families in poverty in favor of a religious leader, soldiers willing to maim or kill in the name of a sovereign ideology. Perhaps we can add in our generation, there are drugs willing to be shamed. Once this happens, it may be difficult to break the followers' disassociation with reality and his or her attachment to the leader or the ideologue. Often, any attempt to do so simply strengthens this debilitating bond. There are ways to insulate ourselves from all this. Even if it has already invaded our cultural systems, I firmly believe that there are ways out. The core of the strategy is the belief that authentic democracies are not only founded on rights that guarantee liberties. These rights, when wielded, must be armed with critical knowledge. These rights must be invoked by strategic and effective interventions. Even freedom of expression is best honored when we are accountable for what we do with it. There are five things, therefore, that I ask you to do for the sake of our societies. When you do these things, you empower yourselves and your communities against the machinations of the powerful. You undermine the status quo. You will prevent the emergence of an authoritarian regime. First, read, analyze, understand, and be critical with respect to all views. We have to adopt the position of skeptic. A Twitter or Facebook post, no matter how eloquent, must be examined. Distinguish whether it asserts a fact or an opinion. If it is a fact, on what is it based? Examine its sources. Competent information is founded on valid sources of information. If it is simply a repost or a retweet, then it has no intrinsic validity. Do not repost nor retweet false news. If anyone asserts an opinion, know that it is simply an opinion. That is, that it is not a fact. The facts upon which it may be, be based may be. We reproduce dominant and powerful narratives that have consequences on the lives of others when we unthinkingly repeat the assertions and views of others. We shape our own society when we are critical of these views and form our own. You all know that when you retweet a falsehood, you hurt others. Second, engage others through conversation. I do not mean through digital media. I mean conversation that requires face-to-face -face discussions. Real conversations teach us how to truly listen to others. It informs us of the nuances of views, the complexity of culture, the variability of solutions. It enhances our humanity. We are able to see facial expressions, discern emotions, understand conviction. We establish relationships that we will learn to value. We will know the relationships are not simply the path or the follow or the unfollow, that it involves a complex of factors. Conversations, the real ones, teach us to be tolerant. In every other person, we find many narratives that will teach us that ours may not be as valued as we have initially believed. He or she that has a complex of real relationships will be wiser. He or she that has these kinds of relationships, not followers in social media, will appreciate humanity. He or she will not be likely to be the lone wolf that will explode the bomb that to maim or kill a stranger. To him or her, those strangers will not be objects for a political cause, specs, on a screen, they will be human beings worth the struggle for social justice. Real conversations prevent the epidemic of social isolation that those who are addicted to social media now suffer. Many have succumbed 
to reducing social human contact through a computer or a smartphone screen. They mistake humans to be specs or accounts in apps. It is the social isolation that prevents true deliberative democracy dialogue. It fosters intolerance and in unaccountability. Third, act on your beliefs. It is not enough that you empathize with those who are poor. <coughs> it is not enough that you are moved by the gross inequalities that are fostered by false knowledge. I reject the premise that propaganda is too powerful that it becomes the only way to shape meaningful social consciousness in a democracy. With every bone in my body, I refuse to accept that our people should forever be malleable through the maintenance of a political economy of ignorance. To be critical is to be subversive. To be critical is to live through the true essence of a democracy, that we should collectively face our reality and contribute, not by adherence to what the majority says, but with loyalty to how we truly see things. For every one of us, the true essence of democracy should be what we authentically participate in. Fourth, do not wait for the outrage or the rupture. Do not expect that throngs of outrage masses will appear to change the status quo. We have learned that even when this happens, without solid grassroots organizations and clear ideological moorings, molded through conscious, tolerant, democratic deliberations, we are condemned to come back to a society which will be simply be a parody of the one that we have rejected. We should strive to create critical and progressive organizations. Collective consciousness and collective action is the precursor to human democracies, and would, this would be progressive and critical organizations and movements. Heroes and heroines are anti-democracy. Genuine democracy should be anti-Lodi. Hashtag anti-Lodi. A progressive organization is united along with similar organizations and movements with the idea that change is necessary and must be directed towards the ideals of social justice. <clears throat> Conscious and collective actions should concretely translate to lesser social inequalities and more genuine participative democracy. Conscious and collective actions should engage the ability of our people, not only those who are in elite positions of government. Conscious and collective action should result in peoples becoming truly authentic. A critical organization is one imbued with the urgency to be aware that injustice must be unmasked. There is a hegemony that pervades through our consciousness as a society. It is reflected in our institutions and holds way mainly through the twin powers of coercion and consensual inertia. Our institutions include the media, law, and generally the kinds of discussions that take place when there are crucial political controversies that happen. A critical view means seeking a deeper understanding of the events. A non-critical view, on the other hand, easily holds us hostage to the slant, the misguided attention, and the personal agenda of others. Progressive and critical organizations reveal themselves when specific issues arise. They wait before they make judgments. When the judgment is made, it is always sophisticated, non-binary, tentative, yet powerful. Finally, have the courage to speak out. Today we hear many of our leaders and those who have access to media demand order at, at almost any cost. We see multitudes applauding warped concepts of the rule of law purchased with summary killings. I hear many who do not question the declarations of states of emergencies of various kinds simply because they are not affected. This is not the rule of law. This is the rule by fear. This is the rule of, this is the rule through insensitivity. I understand the frustrations that may impel these attitudes. But I also understand that, like the dark period of martial law in the past that we have undergone, we may suffer again needlessly. Today, I sense impatience. False news and post-truths become powerful 
because people no longer pay the cost of being critical. Being critical requires understanding more than the depths of a 280-character tweet or a hastily written Facebook post. It requires understanding of what truth really means, what the evidence is, the credibility and degree of knowledge of the author, knowing the author, examining the logics of the statements that are made. Many have disempowered themselves willingly for the like, the retweet, or the repost. Being authentic is never easy. It does not come without the work required. It comes with many painful conversations. I cannot fully describe to you the difficulties of making the right decisions during times of crisis. Then, as now, all I can say is that I know that it takes courage to do what may seem to be unpopular, dangerous, inconvenient, but right. What I have learned is that it is not easy to register one's dissent against a majority. To dissent against a powerful majority brings you outside your comfort zone. It requires that you have the patience to search your own premises. It gives you the opportunity to become truly authentic, in most cases, when yours is the lone dissenting voice. It requires a lot of courage. <clears throat> Silence when we fall victims or after we serve as accomplices to corrupt acts of those in power is also our own powerful political act. Our silence maintains the status quo. Our silence ensures that others will be victimized. Our silence in the face of abuse of power skews the system in favor of those with resources and against those who need the law and its implement implementations more. Our silence legitimizes greed. Our silence undermines the power of public trust. Silence about corruption and abuse of power is not only unjust. Our silence when we have the ability to speak is also a cause of injustice. The question that I ask in many forums that I have been asked to speak is this. Do we still have the passion and the courage to do right by our people? Doing the right thing is necessary because of the poverty, oppression, and helplessness that many experience in our society. There are families that live in squalor. There are children that cannot eat three square meals a day. There are those who live through oppression. There are children raped by their fathers and uncles. There are those robbed of their youth by dangerous drugs. There are those whose identities make them invisible. And there are those who have the power but who do nothing, who do not do enough, or worse, who abuse their power for their own ends. There are those who have power that have already succumbed to those with megaphones, those with amplifiers. Their appreciation of what has been right has been silenced. In the course of many careers, many a judge, a lawyer, or justice, or doctor, or engineer, or entrepreneur, or health professional, law lose the appreciation of the social value of their profession. Somewhere along the way, convenience takes the form of pragmatism. Expediency overwhelms conscience. It is time that we do our part. It is time that we wake up from our passivity and succumb to, and, and succumb to false knowledge and false ideo ideologies. It is time that we seek others and truly and authentic, authentically communicate with them. It is time that we find the courage to do things differently. It is time that we live with the discomfort of doing something that is different, but right and just. It is time that we define for ourselves what will make our more mortal lives truly meaningful. Leon Alejandro was a friend. I saw him evolve into the leader that he was. I lived in an era where he was martyred by cowardly assassins. It was from him that I first heard these words, which truly gives me courage. I share this with you. In times of crisis, the line of fire is always a place of honor. In times of crisis, the line of fire is always a place of honor. There are difficult days ahead of us. Find the patience to read, to think, to share, to organize, and then to act. 
Do not be silent in the face of injustice. I still remember the many chants that we shouted as we walked in protest during my time. We were gas, jeer, tranchant. The UP that I grew up in was critical, resilient, and courageous. It was the UP that was not afraid to speak its truth to power. It was the UP that led, not followed. It was a UP that served as a sanctuary of heresy. It was a UP that truly deserved to be called the University of the People. As I studied, as I participate in the deliberations within the chambers that I inhabit, as I write my decisions, I am still haunted by the words that I first heard in my alma mater, this alma mater. As you leave the great gates of this university, may you also be haunted by these words. And I share them with you. Walang magpapalaya sa atin kung hindi tayo mismo. Walang magpapalaya sa atin kung hindi tayo mismo. Kung hindi tayo kikilos, sino ang kikilos? Kung hindi ngayon, kailan pa? Kung hindi tayo kikilos, sino ang kikilos? Kung hindi ngayon, kailan pa? Iskolar ng bayan, paglingkuran ang sambayanan. Maraming sa mga. The Health Sciences Center awards this plaque of appreciation to the Honorable Marvin Mario Victor F. Leonen, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the Philippines, for imparting wisdom, valuable insights, inspiration, and vigilance to our graduates as speaker during the UP Manila's 109th commencement exercises given this 22nd day of June 2018 at the PICC Plenary Hall, signed Carmencita D. Padilla, Chancellor. <laughs>